Well, hello, everyone. On behalf of my colleagues, welcome to this month's talk from the Johns Hopkins Institute for Assured Autonomy seminar series, co-sponsored by the Computer Science Department of the Whiting School of Engineering. Each month, we'll have a talk on the research topics at the intersection of assurance and autonomy. This seminar will be recorded. Today's speaker is Eugene Choi. Dr. Choi is the Brett Helsell Professor at the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, and also a Senior Research Director at AI2, overseeing the project Mosaic. Her research investigates a wide variety of problems across NLP and AI, including common sense knowledge and reasoning, neural language generation degeneration, language grounding with vision and experience, and AI for social good. Dr. Choi is a MacArthur Fellow and a co-recipient of the NAACL Best Paper Award in 2022, the ICML Outstanding Paper Award in 2022, the ACL Test of Time Award in 2021, the CVPR Longway Higgins Prize Test of Time Award in 2021, the NEUROPS Outstanding Paper Award in 2021, the AAAI Outstanding Paper Award in 2020, the Borg Early Career Award in 2018, the inaugural Alexa Prize Challenge in 2017, IEEE AI's 10 to Watch in 2016, and the ICCP Mar Prize Best Paper Award in 2013. She received her PhD in computer science at Cornell University and BS in computer science and engineering at Seoul National University in Korea. Today, Dr. Choi will talk about common sense, the dark matter of language and intelligence. Welcome, Yijin, and over to you. Thanks, Ken. Um, so I'm super excited to be here. Um, and let's just get started right away. So this talk is going to be about common sense, the dark matter of language and intelligence. And dark matter is what does matter in modern physics. It turns out only 5% of the universe is normal matter that we can see and interact with. And the remaining 95% is dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter is completely invisible, yet scientists speculate that it's there because it influences the visible world, even including the orbits of stars and the trajectory of light. So for language, normal matter is like the visible text, uh, such as words. And then dark matter is the unspoken rules about how the world works, which influence the way people use and interpret language. So that includes common sense and even social norms and models as well. Um, turns out common sense is trivial for humans, but hard for machines. And let me offer three reasons as to why that's the case. So first off, the obvious things are never spoken explicitly. So there's a lot of implicit knowledge. Uh, how many eyes a horse has, GPT-3 used to say, Two, three, two in the front and one in the back, because now the problem has been fixed by ChatGPT. But uh, because people don't talk about these things, these these are too obvious to talk about. So when you train language models on raw internet data, you don't necessarily get that kind of knowledge. And in fact, AI might think that we kill each other a lot more often than we inhale and exhale because of the reporting bias. Uh, that you know, we don't report the things that are just uh, trivial and mundane. Uh, exceptions are not exceptional, but only expected when it comes to common sense rules. So, so birds can fly except when it cannot fly, including when birds are sleeping or uh, newborn birds or birds are trapped in a cage or there's too much of a rain. And uh, there are million reasons as to why birds may not be able to fly. And the thing is, humans can just reason about these things, uh, whereas machines may or may not be able to do so. Now, there's also a lack of universal truth. This is quite important for the purpose of this talk, because the uncomfortable thing about common sense is that it's, it can be ambiguous, it can be messy, 
And as a result, it can be beyond the realm of conventional logic and math. And although common sense is commonly shared knowledge, it's not universally shared knowledge. So frequently asked the questions these days is that whether NLP or common sense, et cetera, has been almost dissolved by ChatGPT. Um, and I'll say there may be a hasty generalization fallacy. So uh, one such case is this um, report uh, on whether theory of mind may have spontaneously emerged in large language models uh, due to a psychologist at Stanford um, because uh, they tested 20 elaborate questions uh, and uh, GPT-3 was able to answer all of them correct. So, you know, maybe it's all good or not. So there were these uh, rebuttal papers that in fact, if you twist those examples a little bit, then uh, language models fail. So um, it's important, especially these days to try uh, different examples because language models can randomly fail. And let me be a little bit more concrete. So as of last year, this is classical theory of mind test. So theory of mind is the ability to reason about what other people know and not know. And this is what children acquire by the age of a four or five. And here's a classical example. Alice and Bob saw apples on the table in the kitchen. And then Alice left the kitchen and Bob moved the apples to the cabinet. So there are two locations. The first location was on the table and then the second location is to the cabinet. And the question is, what would Bob think that Alice will look for the apples? Uh, GPT-3 last year said in the cabinet, this is wrong answer uh, because Alice left the kitchen while Bob moved the apples. Um, and then GPT-4 uh, fixed this problem so that now uh, it that does answer it correctly. Uh, if you stop here, it may seem like, okay, maybe GPT-4 really nailed down theory of mind. But I was curious what happens if I switch the order of these last two sentences in the story. So Alice left the kitchen after Bob moved the apples. And GPT-4 still says the first location. It's almost as if we kind of learned that theory of mind tends to ask a question such that the correct answer is the first location as opposed to second location. Um, depending on how you ask this with a lot more elaborate hint uh, about the situation, you will be able to get the correct answer. And, you know, I noticed some people, so long as you can get one correct answer, it must mean that GPT-4 does have a theory of mind. Whereas, you know, my personal take is that, well, if it's flipping the answer back and forth, it's not the case that it knows it well enough. Um, anywho, so the current situation is almost um, as if uh, it's, uh, the current situation is um, analogous to David and Goliath because um, we keep hearing how extreme scale models are very, very powerful to the point that uh, some folks in academia ask me whether it's even feasible to do any impactful research without extreme scale compute. And so in this talk, I want to address that question, drawing inspiration from an old time classic, The Art of a War, which tells us know your enemy, choose your battles and innovate your weapons. That of course needs some reinterpretation in the modern day AI or deep learning context. So knowing your enemy means evaluation with scrutiny. Uh, it's very important that you uh, evaluate AI inside out, left and right, um, uh, not uh, jumping to the conclusion too soon. But today, I'm going to focus mostly on the innovate your weapons. Uh, in particular, uh, I will offer uh, approaches that are either in the f uh, flavor of inference time algorithms. So, so these are a little bit closer to reasoning algorithms. And then I'll talk about symbolic knowledge distillation, which is more about common sense knowledge. But all of these are in fact applicable, not only common sense challenges, but also broader AI or intelligence challenges as we will see in this talk. Um, and the recurring theme will be that smaller 
can be better, uh, especially when you power the smaller model either with knowledge or reasoning algorithms. Uh, especially knowledge is important. So let's start with the myuric prompting. So it starts with this observation that language models are sometimes amazing. Uh, if you ask GPT-3 the following question, if you travel west far enough from the west coast, will you, you will reach the east coast. So it's a bit of a trick question, but the answer is true because the world is round. So you can eventually reach back. And GPT-3 in this case answers it correctly. But if you ask a different question and, in a, you know, like again, with the scrutiny, asking similar questions in different ways, then you will quickly realize that language models are not very consistent. So butterflies have three wings. Uh, you ask and GPT-3 might say, oh, four wings. But then if you ask back the statement that it just generated, like butterflies have a four wings question mark, then uh, it might actually negate what it just said by saying that, oh no, it has two wings. So um, this is a problem because it's not even clear what does it know uh, precisely. Uh, it turns out this problem is not just the problem of GPT-3. It's a problem of human intelligence as well, uh, which is why Socrates suggested my Uric method to deal with humans' inconsistent reasoning. So let's see whether we can apply to that like idea to GPT-3. So this is for logically consistent reasoning uh, through recursive explanations. The way it works is this. We're going to build a myuric tree, G, by starting with this uh, question that we just saw and prompt GPT-3 by adding uh, a particular answer true and then because so that it can try to explain why the answer is true in this case. So it's E of T, explanation of T, that the earth is round, yada, yada. So this explanation is good. But what if you try to probe GPT-3 by switching true with the false so that it can try to explain why the answer is false? Now, this explanation uh, is a little bit bogus, um, which language models are willing to do, by the way. A hallucination is uh, a problem. So we're going to store this uh, as E of T and E of F. And then we're going to test each of these by asking that back to GPT-3 and see whether it's going to uh, acknowledge, acknowledge or uh, negate uh, what it said. But in this case, it said the true. And then we also ask the negated version of E of T by adding the negation not here in the middle of sentence. And then in this case, it's able to flip the answer, which is good because the question is negated. You also negate your answer. So in this case, GPT-3 is being logical integral to E of T. Uh, but if we try this for E of F, then it's not able to flip the answer because it sort of knows um, that there's something odd or suspicious about its own previous explanation E of F. So here, it's not being logical integral because it's uh, suspecting its own previous explanation. So we use this uh, recursively to generate E of F of T, E of F of F, and so forth, and then build this tree uh, and only keep the logically integral branches. Uh, but even if you do so, uh, GPT-3 being GPT-3, when you look at this entire tree, uh, you will see some inconsistencies. So in order to address that, uh, we're going to do uh, collective inference by first uh, measuring the node-wise confidence score using uh, some conditional probabilities. Uh, in this case, we use this particular equation. The detail is not overly important, but the idea is that we look at both the node-wise confidence as well as the pairwise consistency scores measured by uh, off-the-shelf uh, models that can 
tell whether a pair of statements are entailment or contradiction or neither of the above. Once we have all of these uh, confidence scores measured, then we can uh, uh, formulate this collective inference uh, equation to uh, formulate this as weighted maximum satisfiability problem. So this is classical AI. It's what drove AI research for a, for a while, uh, or, or maybe a decade or two, more like two decades ago. Um, and so we use this solver from uh, two decades ago, and this works really well still. Uh, and it uh, gives um, truth assignment to every single variable in this graph, uh, including the original question node, which uh, this max says solver may have assigned the truth. So if we do this, it turns out you can dramatically enhance the performance of GPT-3, off-the-shelf GPT-3. So here you see that green is vanilla GPT-3, which is barely better than chance. So uh, chance level is 50% and you want 100%. Um, if you do train of thought reasoning, which is a popular technique to enhance the consistency of the off-the-shelf neural language model output, then you get performance jump but still not as high as doing myuric prompting on top of vanilla GPT-3. In fact, uh, this works so well, so that in this case, it can do better than even supervised model trained on top of Google T5. This one is generally harder to beat with a few shot approach, but here it can do uh, that well. And we found that uh, this uh, performance gain uh, is um, maintained in two other common sense benchmarks. So, so these are all very recent common sense benchmarks developed by other people. And um, here we see similar trend. So key takeaway message in this part of the talk is that um, Socrates' myuric method not only enhances the flow of the human reasoning, uh, the computational interpretation of it can dramatically enhance flood GPT-3's reasoning as well. Um, and so that's one example of inference time algorithm that we just looked at. And I will give another one called the neurologic decoding later today, but let's first um, switch the gear and look at an example of a symbolic knowledge distillation. We'll come back to neurologic decoding because of the dependence later, but we start with um, causal common sense model. So this work uh, builds on our previous work known as Atomic and Comet, which are symbolic common sense knowledge graph and neural common sense model. And these are all from 2019. And Atomic, which was the symbolic knowledge graph, was fully crowdsourced by humans up until two years ago. Um, and then that enabled the training of a model like a Comet which is based on neural language models, but trained on top of this symbolic knowledge graph. And uh, in the subsequent years, we also had Comet Atomic 2020, which is an uh, enhanced version of these two. Um, so let me give you a quick uh, example of what this symbolic knowledge graph look like. So this is a subset of Atomic. X gets, uh, you get your car repaired. Uh, imagine that situation. So as a result, you may need to pay the bill and you may need to call Uber or Lyft for a ride. Beforehand, you need to find a mechanic and money. So these are sort of a preconditions and post-conditions of an event. And we also have uh, entity-driven knowledge, such as money can be used for paying repairs. It's made of a paper. Uh, it can also be folded into origami if you so desire, uh, even though... I've never done it. At least you can imagine that this should be feasible due to your naive physics knowledge about the physical affordances of objects. Um, and then we can also think about counterfactual context in which the center event cannot happen. So if you get your car totaled completely, then you cannot get your car repaired. So we can reason about that. We can also reason about what happens before and after. So there are in total, 
uh, 1.3 million common sense if then rules hand annotated over 23 different inference types or relation types. Um, so this was again fully crowdsourced up until two or actually now three years ago. Yeah. So you might wonder uh, what good does this serve if you crowdsource this? So this enables us to train a much smaller but more powerful model. So here what we see is Comet, which is more than 400 times smaller than GPT-3, which is so large so that it doesn't fit into the slide. Um, so Comet is trained on this symbolic knowledge graph, and it's able to perform better than GPT-3 when you look at this precision of the uh, common sense inference uh, that is judged by humans. So here the problem is given a node and then relation type generating some common sense inf inference corresponds to that. For example, you know, what, what, what would happen afterwards or how would someone feel about it given a situation? And so Comet is better than GPT-3 despite the fact that it's much smaller when tested on previously unseen situations. Uh, what is interesting here though, is that GPT-3 is really much better than GPT-2. So this jump was quite remarkable uh, that by scaling things up, you can gain this much gain. So we are going to go back to this. We're going to do something about GPT-3. But let me first mention that when we released resources such as Atomic and Comet, we found that people all over the world do very creative things, including uh, conversation models or figurative language understanding or storytelling and so forth. So we wanted to enhance these resources, but just crowdsourcing the knowledge graph wasn't uh, very, um, uh, it was sort of like hitting the wall, I would say, uh, for both the uh, reasons as to, you know, uh, how much of a resource can we actually, how much of a uh, uh, crowdsourcing can we pay for, but also because human cognition uh, is such that um, crowd workers might be repeating themselves and so forth. So what we decided to do is do something with GPT-3, as I alluded earlier, and we developed this method called the symbolic knowledge distillation that can uh, compress this large model into smaller common sense model that is not only smaller, but better. Um, you might wonder, is that even possible? Because in the classical sense of knowledge distillation, usually you get smaller but worse models. But in this symbolic knowledge distillation case, it's going to be possible because we have this special critic model sitting, uh, which is the key, as you will, you will see in a bit. So let me first compare that through knowledge distillation in a classical sense. So Hinton, due to Hinton 2015, uh, here the idea is to teach a student to model that mimics the teacher's probability distribution by optimizing this cross entropy between the two. This method was originally developed for the case where the output Y is just classification, but here, in our case, especially for common sense inference, the output space is infinite, infinite because uh, you you need the full scope of language to describe the vast uh, scope of common sense inference that we need to describe in language. So it's intractable, but doesn't matter because well, everybody in AI, whenever something is intractable, uh, just sample a few examples and call it a day. In fact, when we do that, we can also uh, connect up the uh, inferences into a graph structure. Um, and uh, so that's a natural byproduct of this uh, process. Now, uh, let me compare uh, the quality and quantity of Atomic 2020 written by human versus Atomic 10X written by GPT-3. So, here, what you see in the y-axis is quantity millions. Um, and so Atomic 2020, in this study, we only look at the a subset of Atomic 2020 
corresponding to causal common sense reasoning. So in terms of quantity, it's less than a million triples. Um, and green portion is a good portion and black is bad. Uh, so if we look at this GPT-3 output, uh, you remember it was about 73% good, which means 30%, about 30% is noise. So uh, it's not very reliable knowledge source. But what we do is then we train this critic model based on small Roberta trained on about tens of thousands of examples of machine output being good or bad. And this model is not very good, but we can use this very aggressively so that we filter out uh, almost all of the black portion. But because it's not very good, it's going to also lose a lot of this good portion. But we can use it for high precision setting so that we throw out a lot, but we still have a lot left with. And the left, what's left is still much bigger than how much we were able to crowd the source uh, by asking humans to write these inferences. So Atomic 10X, uh, when we use critic model, uh, is able to get larger scale and higher accuracy compared to human written resources. Now, uh, what does this mean for downstream neural models? So when we teach neural models using different types of knowledge source, so the original GPT-3 is only about 73% good, but if you train from this loose teacher, the downstream smaller models, common sense performance, already improves to some degree, presumably because the teacher model was just not very good to begin with, and then it may be just easier to beat that. Uh, but it was not still good enough compared to the Comet 2020, which was trained on human written resource. But finally, when you combine this loose teacher with the critics so that they become together critical teacher, then it's able to uh, lead to the pe best performance of all. Um, so to summarize, uh, we found that Atomic 10X written by uh, AI basically can win over uh, human written resource in all criteria for the first time. Uh, in terms of a scale, accuracy and diversity, everything is just better. Um, so we measure diversity in different ways and here, I just only show a unique one gram count, but you can also look at the paper for other measures, but it's all around uh, AI is doing better than crowd workers. So that's the first part, but I wanted to also highlight that this symbolic knowledge distillation method works well for a variety of different tasks. So here, let me show you one example. But uh, from my research group, we actually have almost a dozen different papers of this flavor. Uh, but let me just show you one example. So referee is about uh, sentence summarization. And this is a response to this recent paper by other folks at UT Austin who reported that GPT-3 summaries are better than supervised summarizers from previous years. So depending on which side you are, this is either very exciting or very depressing. Uh, we wanted to see what we can do with GPT-3 uh, as a summary model. But it turns out it's not necessarily, it's a best model perhaps among what's out there, but it's not like a really good model because oftentimes the summary is not a real summary. It's just a repetition of the input. So it's not necessarily compressed. The orange bar here is too long, and then yellow is a good summary, and green is even shorter, but oftentimes it's not summarizing enough. So teacher does have something to improve. So we do this symbolic knowledge distillation as before by grinding GPT-3 down to this funnel uh, to make a model that is smaller, but hopefully better. Uh, and we were able to get uh, improve the compression uh, control so that now we see a lot more balanced uh, summary output. So what did we do for this funnel? So this is where you can be creative and you can do different things for different application scenarios. In this particular work, 
uh, we had these three layers such that uh, it had fidelity filter, it had uh, length filter, it had information bottleneck filter. Um, in particular, fidelity filter is based on off-the-shelf NLI, natural language inference model, which can tell you whether a pair of sentences is an entailment or contradiction or none of the above. A summary should be entailed from the original input text though. So that's why we use this NLI model. Anyhow, so what we do is similar as before, except that in this case, instead of stopping at one iteration of a teaching, we decided to do it for several times because the student model can serve as the teacher model of next generation student, similar to how human society has generations of students being teachers and so forth. Okay, so we found that um, if we do this, then we can really close the gap uh, against the GPT-3, or we can even outperform GPT-3, depending on how what sort of uh, criteria you measure. So that's sort of a quick summary of how symbolic knowledge distillation can be not only useful for uh, generating common sense models, but also diff entirely different tasks such as sentence summarization. Now. Finally, I'm going to uh, tell you about generic knowledge induction, but before we get there, let's quickly look at this inference time algorithm neurologic decoding because there's going to be a uh, content dependency there. So ne neurologic decoding A star ask uh, won a best paper award at Knuckle last year, which actually builds on a very similar uh, work in the previous year called the neurologic decoding. In this talk, I will just uh, tell you a shared uh, summary story between the two papers. And the key observation today is the larger is better, and it just works for any, any application like program synthesis, long form QA, um, and so forth. But it does have some flaws. And one of the flaws is that these large language models are not very good at incorporating logic constraints, even if it's just simple. Like here, for example, generate a question containing all of these given keywords, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. And uh, it generated this sentence, what, what is the mass of Jupiter? So it incorporated only two out of four keywords. And this is a very simple case of logic constraints. Um, so it turns out, search algorithm used to be an important aspect of a classical AI. And in fact, it's still relevant for some of the modern deep learning success because Monte Carlo tree search was key ingredient behind AlphaGo. In fact, without which I really don't think that just deep learning alone would have worked out as, as successfully as it did. So Monte Carlo tree search was really, really important. And inspired by that, I, we were wondering what else are we missing? Like maybe there's something we can do better with the search algorithm. So typically when you lose, use language model, people don't really talk about decoding algorithm and they tend to do something really simple there, such as uh, beam search or uh, sampling. But what if we can actually do something much better for that decoding algorithm such that what if we can incorporate any logical constraints on the fly during inference time, even if it's a brand new, previously unseen logical constraints. Certainly humans are able to do that, by the way. You know, if I give you logic constraints about how you should incorporate Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, and then either mass or masses, you can totally do that. You don't need to fine tune yourself over tens of thousands of examples to do so. So that's what we wanted to do. And in fact, a lot of uh, uh, text generation applications do require logic constraints. So you might have table to text generation scenario, or you might have image captioning scenario in which you want to ensure some objects are mentioned in the caption, or even for motion translation, there may be some grammatical rules that you can incorporate through logic constraints as well. So in a nutshell, what we uh, do in this 
first the paper neurologic decoding is a search algorithm uh, that requires you to write this sophisticated beam search algorithm that can work with uh, conjunctive normal, normal form as uh, logic constraints. I'm not going to go into this search algorithm trellis, uh, but let me tell you, sketch out why this is somewhat non-trivial to do, because when you look at different clauses, they are either satisfied or unsatisfied in a way that is reversible or irreversible, and you have to keep track of those close satisfaction and then try to ensure that diverse set of diverse subset of clauses are being satisfied when you do the beam search. Um, it's it's a somewhat involving, but on the other hand, it's not it's not overly difficult. Um, in fact, uh, the lead author of the both of these papers. Uh, was an undergraduate student at the time of these paper publications. So uh, undergrad students fresh off from algorithm class can perform really, really well with this type of research. So here, uh, let's see the performance of common gen. So common gen is a data set where you give, you're given a few keywords to incorporate into text generation. So you have to generate some reasonable text and let's first look at coverage of constraint satisfaction. 100% is what you want. Um, in the x-axis, you see the model size increasing. And then the blue bar, the blue line is what happens with the beam search applied to supervised models. And so here you see the classical story of a bigger the better. Supervised models can learn better when the models are larger, but Compared to neural logic, so neural logic green is used on top of a supervised model. Neural logic yellow is used on top of unsupervised, just off the shelf language model. So whether you use neural logic on top of a supervised model or unsupervised, just in terms of constraint satisfaction, the performance is very strong all around. And uh, in terms of Ruja meter, which is uh, n-gram based measurement, that correlates with the quality of output. Here, the higher is better. Again, you see blue line says the larger is the better. That's a familiar story. Um, but what's interesting is that the unsupervised neurologic can outperform supervised blue line. Uh, unsupervised neurologic can outperform supervised, but also unsupervised neurologic on smaller network can outperform supervised approaches on larger networks. So unsupervised models on smaller network starts so strong right off the bat to the point that it's actually doing better than supervised model that is using conventional beam search. So uh, this is one strong takeaway message here is that, well, everybody talks about how, you know, they're going to invest more and more into larger models. But if we spend just a fraction of that effort into inference time algorithm, well, you can get dramatic performance boost as well. Um, so having seen this result from our previous work, we wanted to see what else can we do in our uh, subsequent work called the Neurologic Asterisk. Um, in this Asterisk case, uh, the gist of the idea is that we want to be able to project it to the future because this conventional neurologic decoding or our previous neurologic decoding can only reason about the past and the current, but it's not able to reason about the future. But this A star search algorithm from our AI textbook says that we should be able to project to the future, then we can definitely improve our search algorithm. And because uh, designing the heurist admissible heuristic for neural language models is impossible, this is only A star esque. It's only inspired by A star search, but it's not uh, uh, admissible heuristic. Anyhow, when you try to look ahead to the future, there are multiple things we could do. We could do greedy look ahead, or we could do um, sampling, sorry, beam search based look ahead, or we could do sampling based look ahead. Uh, we tried basically different heuristics and uh, compare them. And we found that uh, sometimes one is better than the other, 
But so long as we look ahead, uh, in general, the performance improves. So we found that uh, even for a constrained machine translation case, and then several different application scenario. I'm here for lack of space showing you only three, but the paper reports um, uh, quite a few different application scenarios as well. So these are all uh, tested on non-common sense um, a lot of non common sense problems, but part of the reason why we developed the neural logic decoding in the first place is so that we can do the next paper about generic common sense induction. So, this is a case where um, we wanted to get rid of GPT 3 as the teacher model and then only use GPT 2 as a student, uh, teacher model. That's almost mission impossible, by the way. And here, generic induction or generic statement means that uh, statements such as birds can fly. And this is a form of inductive reasoning. Uh, and generics, this is linguistic terminology about such a statement. So what we wanted to do is this uh, intellectual, just like out of curiosity, can we actually do something with the GPT-2, uh, which is such a bad... Uh, weak language model and then bit over GPT-3. So uh, the task here is given any uh, concept such as bicycle, uh, we want to generate some uh, generic statement about bicycle. And if you try to do that using GPT-2 off the shelf, so the way it works is that we're gonna give some beginning of a sentence like a bicycle can, bicycle has, bicycles, uh, then, GPT-2 output will be generally quite bad. But what we can do is you, we use a neurologic decoding to constrain the output of off-the-shelf uh, language models so that the output doesn't do long storytelling, but at least syntactically, it looks like a generic statement, meaning simple sentence that doesn't use relative clauses and then... Um, it looks like it's doing some inductive knowledge statement, like bicycles are also pedal. So the problem here is that although on the surface, it looks like plausible generic statement, uh, the content is not very good. And this is what happens with, you know, when you try to do GPT-2, which is generally such a weak language model. But what we do then is to have this critic model to filter out. So basically the same thing as before, um, but we filter out GPT-2 output even more aggressively than ever before because GPT-2 is such a weak teacher model to begin with. But we found that when we do this iteratively, we can uh, make the student next generation so much stronger so that we can improve considerably. Now, compared to uh, previously existing knowledge resources such as Generics KB, which is generic statement extracted from the web, <coughs> which had um, high, highly noisy uh, uh, quality. So accuracy was only 76% good. Compared to that, if you pull knowledge out of GPT-2, then you can do really at scale, like in our case, almost like 16 millions of them, but the overall accuracy is not good. Even with the neural logic decoding, the overall accuracy was only about 40 or 45% good. But we do this critic very, very aggressively so that we can get rid of most of the black portion and then keep some of the green portion. And then uh, we do this iteratively so that eventually we can build much bigger uh, portion where the accuracy is also beyond the 90%. Um, we also wanted to win over GPT-3. So here you, what you see is precision recall-like curve uh, where GPT-3 is a red line, which is quite shockingly good. It's almost like 80%. Uh, for most of this curve. So beating this is quite hard. By the way, GPT-3 originally was not very good. GPT-3 Da Vinci, the vanilla version was not very good, but suddenly the instructor version was very good. So this is the best instruct 
uh, version, Da Vinci model. But we found that uh, we were able to beat over it when we do this um, distillation very aggressively. So um, this is another example how the scale alone may not be the only way to enhance the performance. So um, encouraged by this, we are doing this in many other cases uh, as a work in progress as well. Uh, but in general, smaller models can democratize AI models, not only save the energy, uh, but also it does help with interpretability and corrigibility because it allows you to inspect the quality of knowledge and then make a correction, which can then enhance the uh, behavior of the downstream neural models. Um, and so let me maybe... We, we have a lot going on, but maybe, maybe let me just very, very briefly highlight the script knowledge distillation, which might have some uh, downstream use cases for physical systems. So in this work coming soon, we have an archive idea, but we're busy writing things up right now. Uh, basically what we distill is uh, knowledge that can be relevant for planning, like goals, plans, conditions, and counterfactual plans. So we organize all this as a semi-structured uh, uh, knowledge, and we distilled it out of GPT-3. And then we also developed this planning algorithm that can further enhance the behavior of this model. Uh, so we have this decoding algorithm called the verifier guided decoding that can enhance the quality of planning much better because um, even GPT-4 uh, is not very strong at planning. There has been this uh, Sparks of AGI paper that identified planning as one of the weaknesses of these large models. And there's nothing wrong with using decoding algorithm or inference algorithm that can enhance uh, the weaknesses of such large language models. So we found that when we do this sort of informed uh, knowledge distillation uh, together with informed um, inference, we can dramatically enhance. Uh, so this is a virtual home environment where we test our knowledge. And previous approach used GPT-3 DaVinci and they got very strong results, but we were able to enhance uh, over even that strong results by using smaller model, but uh, trained on better organized uh, script knowledge, and then also enhanced with inference time uh, algorithm. Um, I will skip over some of these uh, other examples of knowledge distillation and jump to some closing remarks. So um, as you might remember, common sense was considered to be research topic of the 70s and 80s. So when my group started working on this in 2017, we were very much discouraged uh, that don't even say the word, uh, but we felt that the past failures are actually inconclusive when uh, these early researchers, despite how smart they were, uh, didn't have the right kind of uh, tools available to them, uh, such as computing power, uh, the amount of data, and so forth. And so um, we uh, had this intuition that we can do much better uh, at commons. We can crack common sense finally, powered with these modern resources and technologies. But at the same time, it's unlikely that um, uh, we can reach to this moonshot research goal by brute force larger networks with the deeper layers because you don't reach to the moon by making the tallest building in the world one inch taller at a time. Um, quickly in 2020, um, we started seeing a lot more enhancement. So uh, when we first proposed this very first common sense tutorial at ACL, uh, reviewer number two told us that, oh, you're not gonna get, this is a niche topic and you're not going to get uh, very many audience uh, attending your tutorial, but it turns out to be the second most popular tutorial uh, in that year. So, um, and also despite working on this niche topic, 
uh, the students at that time all became quite successful as professors as well. So um, that was uh, quite exciting. And then it also led to uh, keynotes at different conferences last year, uh, as well as um, uh, this year, more, more keynotes coming up. The keynote at ACL was drawing analogy from modern physics. Uh, if you want to check it out, uh, then the YouTube uh, recording is available. Um, it's a strange talk that makes some analogy to dark matter and uh, space-time continuum and how some of these aspects of common sense uh, might be uh, analogous to that. Um, but um, in this talk, I didn't get to talk much about it. Um, in any case, um, addressing the earlier question about you know David and Goliath, I in fact I do think scale and loss are real. Uh, denial is futile, and I really liked this, especially the second paper of the scaling law series. Uh, really converted my thought on scale. Uh, really, scale is important and necessary, uh, sorry, important and necessary condition, but not sufficient condition of making things that really, really work in a robust manner. So I do think that there's other, there are other important things we need to address, um, but the scale is undeniable. So to address the current limitation though, I, I uh, believe that language models are not equivalent to, to knowledge models or even reasoning models. We probably do need to uh, enhance our algorithms and knowledge models uh, through different uh, means. Uh, we especially need to learn to abstract away uh, and humans do learn a great deal of uh, knowledge through declarative form. And in fact, uh, that is what symbolic knowledge distillation tries to mimic as well. Um, and although there's so much emphasis right now um, on the larger model being better, and even though I do buy into scale being an important ingredient, uh, I think there's a lot we can do by focusing on building knowledge models and also focusing on in-first-time algorithms in which we can make smaller models also really good or even better. So that's the takeaway message, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Wow. Thank you, Yichen, for a, a very full and uh, complete uh, background in this uh, subject matter and some very uh, fascinating look aheads uh, to the future. We have a couple of questions. I'll get started, and then I'll turn it over to panelists for any questions they may have. Uh, the first one is, having seen the benefit that can be obtained by playing around with decoding algorithms, how do you feel about closed models that only allow API calls? And what do you think is an effective way for academics to advocate for open models? Yeah, uh, I do think open models are very, very important for so many different reasons. But um, the closed model only th available through API it's just all around the problematic, especially from scientific point of view, that it's not reproducible. Any, nothing is reproducible. Nobody knows whether a test set is leaked and then this you know, updated model is trained directly on the test set, in which case the fact that supervised training works on memorizing training data set is not a news. And in fact, whenever you train smaller model directly on the uh, like similar distribution, the smaller model always works well. So there's that problem. But the, the bigger problem, which is quite interesting, is that um, there's a concentration of a power which is not healthy by, uh, it, it's just uh, all around the concerning. So I, in order to open it though, now suddenly this, the importance of a smaller model becomes even more important because most people, even if the GPT-3 or 4 were to be open, do not even have the resources to do anything with it. Like we, we cannot even fine tune these models or we cannot really inspect them without sufficient amount of GPUs and engineers. So what it means is that all the more we need to focus more on the smaller models that can be equally capable. 
Thank you. And then one final question is, is embodied intelligence a potentially promising direction to develop common sense knowledge in AI? Yes. Um, in fact, some of my own research is multimodal in nature as well, uh, though I personally found that multimodal research can oftentimes require even more compute because images and videos are more expensive to uh, process um, or more, more data to process, I should say. Uh, the model itself can be smaller for them, but um, so uh, it's not an easy fit. And even if we were to do so, there's a different challenge around how the data is not readily available uh, or the data that is available like YouTube data is not necessarily the sort of a multimodal embodied uh, experiences that humans will have. Uh, so uh, there's a fundamental limitation about the sort of data that is available in that space, uh, which also is a huge open research challenge right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, a follow-up question. For the longer term, do you think deep learning with additional inference time algorithms will be sufficient for common sense? Or do we need something fundamentally different, such as uh, machine learning frameworks, which are more biologically plausible? Oh, yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, I Personally, um, I'm having a lot of fun with the inference time algorithm in that it tends to work surprisingly well and it doesn't require uh, boring hyperparameter tuning that students usually have to suffer through otherwise with modern deep learning, whereas inference time algorithms feel like more intellectually pleasing and it tends to work just right away. Uh, so we are having a lot of fun, but in some sense, it's just sort of like a post hoc patching of the problematic language models. So it's uh, deeply dissatisfactory in that regard. And I do wonder um, if we were to find an alternative path to uh, robust intelligence, then the path might be uh, inspired by human cognition in some ways. I don't necessarily think that we have to mimic everything uh, because we're just a different machine uh, compared to a neural network that we can actually build. But um, there's something really fundamentally missing in the way that current neural networks are trained mm -hmm. in a monotonic consumption of data with zero interaction, zero question answering, zero uh, introspection. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you imagine how human babies might be raised by feeding a lot of New York Times and you know Reddit data and YouTube videos where the child has zero capability about selecting the content and it has to read everything like in sequence um, and no question that they can ask, probably they will not learn very well. So I do think that there's really something fundamentally missing there. Huh. Wow, well, fascinating, absolutely brilliant talk. I really enjoyed that. And coming from the robotics perspective, you know, in particularly in the space robotics and in the marine robotics side, we care a great deal about uh, about getting these uh, constraints right. So, you know, I kind of looked at, at a lot of these planning problems as sort of a constraint propagation problem, um, which of course we tend to do by hand in uh, in the robotics world. It's not a very scalable it's not a very scalable solution. But I do wonder if there's some crossover. Crossover possible there, possible there, and 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 certainly the whole causality um, piece of it would seem to come out of your last comment, right? I mean, sort of, you know, when you're interacting with something, you know, one of the questions you're you're trying to tease out is is sort of the cause and effect piece of it. So, hmm. Very yeah, yeah. I see, we're out of time. Um, Thank you so much, Yijin, for uh, sharing your research with us, and we look forward to collaborating with you uh, in the future. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for joining us, and have a great day. Goodbye. <laughs>